evening, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you're just coming in, there are some seats up front here. Uh, I think the seats are back here. So get to know your neighbor. Hopefully you know their name by the end of the night. Um, my name is Marissa Delcom, and I'm the executive director of Art House Dallas. We are so glad to have you here. Um, this is our first in-person event in a year and a half. Um, I know, right? Uh, it came sooner than we thought it would, but we're so happy to actually gather people. Um, we are a nonprofit that really thrives off of people and community and programs. And so being virtual the last year and a half, while we love it and we have found a way to maintain, there is nothing like human to human connection. So thank you all for being here. I know you're just as excited as we are. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about the work that we do at Art House. Um, we are a community of many types of people that really desire to learn and to grow together. So a night like tonight is just one example of the work that we do. Uh, we have songwriters and poets, visual artists, we have entrepreneurs and patrons. Um, really, our community is made up of people who want to really figure out what it means to live creatively and imaginatively and to really pursue the common good of our city. So if that is of any interest to you, we would love to get to know you. Um, we would love for you to figure out how to um, really engage with our work. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities through the year, everything from spiritual formation series and programming to uh, artist-specific discipline programming as well. So uh, one thing I did want to mention uh, is each year, I mentioned spiritual formation, each year we publish a meditative reader. Um, this meditative reader is full of visual art and poetry, um, really fantastic texts that support our themes, um, scripture, prayer, and, and a lot more. Uh, if this is interesting, please pick one up on the way out. We have plenty at the table. We'd love to meet you. Um, this year, our series was on believing. Um, next year, we're working on that now. So um, come talk to us. We'd love, like I said, we'd love to get to know you. Um, finally, I did want to mention we are a nonprofit. Um, all the work that we do is supported by the generosity of the community. A lot of you know that tomorrow is North Texas Giving Day. Um, so we would just ask that you would consider uh, Art House Dallas and your giving tomorrow. Um, nights like tonight are possible because of the support that we receive from all of you. Um, so please consider us. Um, I did want to mention a couple of other nonprofits that are here tonight um, and have also made this evening possible. So um, Image Journal and Central Commons. Uh, if you're not familiar, two incredible organizations that you should also get to know. Um, some of our folks are floating throughout the evening, but we will be at a table. So if you have questions about anyone's work tonight, please get to know um, anyone from those organizations. So I'm just going to read a little bit about um, our missions and then uh, introduce Jamie. So um, a little bit about Central first. So the space that you're in is Central Commons. This space spans 34,000 square feet, and there is a lot of amazing work being done here. Um, Central Commons' mission is to work in community to extend the fellowship of Christ into every part of Dallas. Uh, they want to incubate the next generation of churches. So they actually have about five church plants that meet here on Sunday, which is amazing. Um, we're so thankful to Blake and to Jenna and all the work that they're doing here. Um, there's so much more happening. There's a dog park in the back that has a Sunday morning worship service. It's really amazing the work they're doing. So um, Blake and Jenna are around somewhere. Please talk to them if you have questions about what's going on here. Um, and finally, Image Journal. Um, so Image Journal, we have been familiar with their work for years. We have always highly respected their work. We have received their journal for years. They are a literary journal. They were founded in 1989. Um, really founded to demonstrate the continued validity and diversity of contemporary art and literature that engage with religious traditions of Western culture. It's one of the leading literary journals. Uh, it's published in English, and it's read all over the world uh, and really forms the nexus of a very warm and active community. So um, if you haven't picked up a copy, they do have some tonight. Um, I'm sure Jamie's going to share a little bit more about their work. Um, it's, it's really amazing, and if you haven't heard of them, I think you'd be delighted to know what they're doing. All right, so the reason you're here. Um, this incredible talk that we have titled um, Quiet and a Noisy Life, the arts as an invitation to a contemplative life. Um, many of you know James K.A. Smith. 
Um, but I'm going to read just a little bit about his background, and, um, and then he'll come up. So James K.A. Smith is the professor of philosophy at Calvin College. Prior to joining Image, so he is the editor-in-chief at Image Journal. Prior to joining Image in 2018, he was the editor-in-chief of Comment Magazine for six years. He's an award-winning author and speaker, and his books include On the Road with St. Augustine, Imagining the Kingdom, and You Are What You Love. He's written for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Christianity, Christianity Today, and many others. So if you'd please welcome James K. Smith. Um, what I'm going to call the entwinement of contemplation and contemporary art. But I'm going to get there sort of backwards. That is, I, I, I want to start with thinking about the significance of a contemplative life, and then I'll consider how and why the arts contribute to this. If if you know me at all, unsurprisingly, I'm going to start with St. Augustine. <laughs> the young Augustine, when uh, um, uh, he sort of had this inkling and hunger for God, thought that he had to climb his way to God. He thought that the pathway to spiritual encounter was one of ascent. But late in his confessions, he tells us of the moment he realized that, in fact, God was closest when he started to look within. So while the wonders of the created world dazzled him, Augustine was actually more overwhelmed by the infinite when he turned to contemplate his own soul and hit upon the depth that he couldn't plumb anymore. This is in book 10 of the Confessions. I know you're all going to go home tonight and read it. But in, in book 10, what's going on is he, he says, where is God? What do I love when I love my God? And he's, he's exploring the natural world and the created world and the cosmos. And he's looking and, he's, and he realizes that, in fact, the proximity of God is discovered when he turns inside. And when he turns contemplatively to look within, he says, it is a vast and infinite profundity. I myself cannot grasp the totality of who I am. So when, when Augustine sort of turns and contemplates his own self, he encounters a mystery, and his inability to grasp himself is really the prelude to then encountering this God of grace who is beyond all that we could ask or think. So contemplation of oneself was a prelude to humility because when he turns to try to even understand himself, the murky waters of his own desires and hopes or what he calls the cavern of his memory, he's amazed at how little he comprehends of himself. So contemplation introspection leads to humility, to a sense of awe before a mystery, which then turns into the perfect posture to finally experience the intimacy of a God who is at once creator of the cosmos and yet nearer to me than myself. In fact, Augustine puts it this way. He says to God, you were more inward than my inward parts. You were more inward than my most inward part. So encountering God, Augustine discovered, was not so much about spiritual fireworks and spectacle. 
What Augustine needed to encounter God was stillness. But in our cultural moment, that itself might be a miracle. To be still? Indeed, I think one of the greatest threats to a deeper spirituality is the temptation of incessant distraction. That's the noise. Now, in a sense, this isn't new at all. So in, in, in some ways, there's nothing new under the sun. And so one of my favorite philosophers, who's also a mathematician, uh, Blaise Pascal, and folks have heard of Pascal's pensées. Pascal in the 1600s was already diagnosing this contemporary problem for us. He says, we entertain ourselves precisely to avoid asking uncomfortable questions like, who am I? Am I happy? What do I love? We don't want to face those questions. And so we distract ourselves. We happily accept the diversions offered us because it prevents us from having to face up to the human condition. In fact, as Pascal puts it, humanity's unhappiness springs from one thing alone, our inability to sit quietly in a room. Our unhappiness springs from one thing alone, our inability to stay quietly in one room. We love our distractions and our diversions because, you know, the risk in boredom is that you might come face to face with the ultimate. <laughs> Listen, I know I'm not the only one. We can't even sit at a stoplight anymore <laughs> without doing this. I might have missed something. I've got 35 seconds. Listen to, Dake, listen to uh, Pascal, this is from the 1600s. Nothing is so intolerable for man as to be in a state of complete tranquility. Without passions, without business, without diversion, without effort. Because then he feels his nothingness, his abandonment, his inadequacy, his dependence, his helplessness, his emptiness. We we want our frantic pursuits and exhausting distraction because they keep us from facing these uncomfortable questions. Augustine says we prefer the hunt to the kill. We want the gamble of the casino and the market not to win the money, but just to distract ourselves from the rumbling inquietude that haunts us when we stop. I don't know if anybody else is watching Billions, but that is the entire plot of Billions, okay? The busyness of our diversions, filling up time with things to keep us occupied, whether it's just tinkering and puttering and never being able to sit still or frenetically chasing the next socialite event or always having something blaring on a screen in front of us, that's, that is probably as old as leisure time itself. What is new, however, is how easy our technological developments have made it for us to keep ourselves distracted. That's a new thing. Our society offers a myriad of liturgies to make you love distraction rather than reflection. It's the proximity and the immediacy and the anonymity of the smartphone that intensifies this human tendency. A world of diversion is always with me in my pocket. And the whir of the scrolling screen keeps me titillated without investment. It, it offers the so-called gift of distraction without asking me to give really much of myself beyond a very superficial kind of attention. Now this is something I want to dwell on a bit. Different kinds of attending. See, what, what the smartphone asks of me is a kind of attention 
that really never disturbs me or taxes me or pierces below my own surface, right? It rarely ever challenges me or asks anything of me, especially when I curate my online experience and just keep confirming my own biases. So we, we love our echo chambers because they cost so little and they conform, confirm so much. We can even come to love art that doesn't ask very much of us. In an age of distraction, we are in fact giving a kind of attention constantly, but it's the sort of attention that is fleeting, superficial, it's low cost attention. It's really just a kind of noticing, right? It's attention, it's the sort of attention of just a constant glance. In contrast, what is contemplation? Contemplation demands a kind of attention that is focal, that is sustained, and that leads to vulnerability. Such contemplative attention only flourishes when we can quell distractions. It, it, it's a high cost kind of attention, but it also offers bigger returns, if you will. It offers the possibility of the infinite, even if those returns are not instant, immediate. So, such contemplation requires introspection, which is then this sustained attention to oneself, to our interior life. And the mystery that, that Augustine points us to is the fact that this is a kind of attention to oneself that is not self-absorption. It's actually an attention to one's own soul that makes you encounter something bigger than yourself. Now, the, the institutions of postmodernity mitigate against that sort of attention constantly. In no small part, let's be honest, because there is a lot of money to be made in distraction. That's why the hardware and software of a distracting society ends up becoming the wallpaper of our own consciousness. But here's why this should matter for us. If, what if distraction is a spiritual condition. If distraction is a spiritual condition, then this means that we are actually unwittingly seeding our spiritual lives to Distraction Incorporated. Because these institutions create rituals that are habit forming, our spiritual habits of attention are being formed by these institutions and technologies and machines and in this battle between distraction and contemplation, fleeting versus focused attention, I want to suggest that something at the very heart of the Christian life is at stake. Uh, in a really insightful essay uh, by uh, Baylor's Alan Jacobs, I'm, I'm throwing you some Texas gold here for a sec, okay? So Alan Jacobs wrote this great essay several years ago called Habits of Mind in an Age of Distraction. And he points out how these technological developments have really hampered our ability to be introspective. And yet, introspection, being able to look at ourselves, is at the very heart of a relationship to God. Introspection is necessary for confession. Introspection is essential for cultivating openness for God. So if Distraction Incorporated is squelching our ability to be introspective, it is also shutting down the possibility for how we could relate to God. Jacobs reflects on a, on a young person who is, or it doesn't have to be a young person, it can be a 60-something. 60 60-somethings 60 love Facegram and Facebook and Instagram too. Wow, just saying Facegram was the <laughs> oldest thing I have ever done in my life. Very Liz Lemon moment for a second. <laughs> Jacobs just reflects on, on the way we get absorbed by something. We live our lives on, say, an Instagram. And he says, there is a relationship between a distraction and addiction. 
but we are not addicted to devices. That's not the way to see it. We are addicted, he says, to one another. We are addicted to the affirmation of our value. Our very being that comes from others. We are addicted to being validated by our peers. Now, do you see how that's actually bears witness to a human hunger? And then he makes this Pascalian point, which is the strange paradox that we actually choose our chains. Do you know what I mean? We opt for this enslavement to a device. And it impedes the kind of attention I need for introspection, for that kind of Augustinian spelunking expedition where I make time to dive down into the caverns of my soul and God shows me something of himself at the bottom of it. Okay. So what does this have to do with art? Well, for me, one of the gifts of contemporary art is that it asks me to move from the frenetic pace of incessant distraction and consumption to pause and dwell. One of the subtle gifts of contemporary art, and it, it could be painting or poetry, or we could talk about all kinds of genres, but one of the subtle gifts of contemporary art is that it actually demands something of me. And above all, it demands that I make myself available for contemplation. This is because this, <laughs> this is because such art does not yield easily accessible nuggets of sentiment or pleasure. It's why we, if we're honest, there are a lot of days we don't like it. It's like, come on, give me, I need something quick and easy and fast. Contemporary art is not going to give you that. Contemporary art is humbling precisely because it is demanding. A contemporary work can challenge us, can put us off kilter. It can make us feel like we are no longer in charge. Like we don't know what to do. In some ways, it's precisely the difficulty of contemporary art. It's, it's refusable, refusal to be immediately available to just mere surface attention. That's what I want to embrace in contemporary art as a contemplative discipline. Remember, for Augustine, the prelude to his intimate encounter with God was the experience of not knowing of being a mystery to himself, of being overwhelmed and befuddled and puzzled and wondering. It was an experience of not understanding. And that sort of decentering puts me back on my heels and humbles me. That's exactly the way I experience so much contemporary art. It, it, re it requires of me a posture of humility. And those dispositions have spiritual significance. Let me, let me try to describe an example. And I'm going to try to describe an example from visual art, which makes no sense because I should be showing you the example. Um, but, the, but there are certain limits of our technological capacity here. And I also took this as a gauntlet being thrown down to me as a writer to say, could I describe a piece of visual art for you and get you to feel what I'm talking about? We'll see. You tell me afterwards. I have been spending the last while dwelling with the work of a 20th century painter named Agnes Martin. She is not a household name. Don't feel like you should know who that is. Um, though many of her contemporaries and friends were household names, the Pollocks and Ad Reinharts and so on of, of uh, the generation. She was born in Saskatchewan, Canadian girl. Uh, she was raised by uh, Presbyterians of a hardy stock on the plains of Western Canada. She spent formative years in New York City before settling really hermit-like in a cabin she built by hand in New Mexico. You maybe have seen some of her paintings. They're generally square canvases of about five or six feet. 
And she's often associated with a, a kind of minimalism. M many of her later canvases are these uh, um, sort of panels of horizontal lines and bands that um, are so kind of beguiling because they're, they're awash in a color palettes that just seem calibrated for the soul's peace and tranquility. Like you, you, you immediately encounter it and there's just something that sort of like washes over you and you can sort of live with this thing and there's, there's an immediate sort of response to it. S sadly, I would say it's also because they work so well that way that they're susceptible to a certain kind of Pinterest driven reproduction, which, does, which means you are missing something. So I, I want to focus instead on one of her earlier works. Many of these early works, so I'll try to picture this, this is a square canvas, five or six feet wide. Many of them are grids. In fact, some of them are these meticulous lines that create all these cells, columns, and rows. And for those of us who live after Windows 95, it's very, very hard not to see this at first and think, expel spreadsheet. L literally. I mean, some of these you're like, this is, ar this is art? I, mean, I could have made this, just tell me five columns, three rows, you know what I mean? Even I could do this in, well, I would do it in Microsoft Word because I don't know how to do spreadsheets, but you know what I mean. So it looks like at first you see this sort of almost kind of mathematical division of the canvas into these grids, and you might think, oh, this is produced by a machine. Until you stop and dwell, dwell with them for a while. For example, I'm gonna, let me try to describe one. It's a 1961 painting called The Islands. It is a panel of shimmering ochre on which are inscribed hundreds of tiny cells with graphite. The majority of the cells are then dotted with tiny white dabs, each one singular and unique. So as you get closer, when you, walk, when you first walk into the gallery, you see the grid, you see this system, you think machine-ish, mechanical, mathematical, geometrical, whatever it might be. Except then as you get closer, you realize, oh, there is depth and texture here. The flatness of the grid gives way to something more like the weave of a rug, as if the canvas were a textile. And then when you give yourself time to inch even closer, attentive, dwelling, contemplative, you encounter the humanity of the artist. Each of those lines is hand drawn. And each of those white dots is from the light touch of a hand. And it becomes humbling to be in the face of such a patient, meticulous creation. And you start to sense something of, that the artist gave of herself to give us this work. And it's a distinct kind of thrill, actually, to realize that this work is so many different things depending on where you stand and how you are giving yourself to it. The way your attention is calibrated, it is many things at once. There are layers in this work depending on how you attend to it. I wanted to talk about why I think this is like John Ruskin's um, uh, beauty of the Gothic, but I've been talking too long already, so I'm gonna skip that. But I'll tell you, there was some real gold in here about uh, uh, um, the nature of the Gothic and why what, what John Ruskin, a great Victorian critic said is, part of the beauty of uh, this Gothic tradition, this Christian tradition in art and architecture, is that it takes up the imperfections of human creation as beautiful. As, as part of what makes the work shine with beauty. Now, what I wanna say though, none of this discovery about an Agnes Martin painting is just available when you walk up to the painting. 
The painting doesn't give itself away cheap. It asks us to pause, to be still, to give it time. Such insight and epiphanies are only found in the quiet of contemplation. Indeed, Martin herself once appended an instruction to one of her series of grids, and she had it placed alongside in the exhibit. These prints, she says, express innocence of mind, but then with this important proviso, if, if you can go with them and hold your mind as empty and tranquil as they are and recognize your feelings at the same time, you will realize the full response of the work. That, uh, I have to tell you, when I heard that sort of um, counsel for how to encounter one of her paintings, I could not stop thinking about St. Ignatius of Loyola's instructions for the daily examine, which is pause, pay attention to your feelings, and ask, what is God doing in me at this moment? This is why I see the arts, contemporary art in particular, as sort of a preamble, a prelude to the kinds of dispositions that are also opening us up to the transcendence of God. So much good stuff you're not getting here. I'm just, but still. Um, when I experience art, whose meaning and significance is not easily available, art that demands a different kind of attention, I am developing dispositions and habits that are also like pathways God is going to use for me to encounter him afresh and anew and the still small voice that maybe keeps getting squeezed out by everything else that's going on in my life. What I have to learn is how to sit still long enough to notice. One of the most convicting pictures I have seen of such spiritual stillness was Darius Martyr's recent film, The Sound of Metal. How many have seen The Sound of Metal? Okay, homework. After this, I hope everybody wants to see it. Maybe mild spoilers, but it's, okay. it's worth it. The film follows the harrowing journey of Reuben, who is a heavy metal drummer who experienced... There is a Wilco line there for some of you. Okay, anyway. He's a heavy metal drummer who experiences catastrophic hearing loss at a very young age. What is particularly unique about the movie is its sonic environment. The way the soundtrack invites us in and out of Reuben's, not his point of view, but his point of hearing. A world that begins in the film, I mean, the, the opening scene is like this overwhelming wall of sound that hits you. And then interestingly, it's followed by these crisp tinkles and soft sounds of coffee being made in the morning and burbling water and things like that. A world that begins with all that sound is going to give way to muffled rumbles. And you can feel the world receding in sound. Now, because Reuben is also an addict, his partner is worried that this heartbreak of losing his hearing is going to be a catalyst for a relapse. And so she finally convinces him to spend time in a recovery community for the deaf, where they learn to stave off their addiction while accepting and even welcoming a new way of experiencing the world and community. It's a really, really powerful picture. There is a key scene in which Joe, an actor, uh, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but Joe is sort of like the senior, he's the abbot, if you will, of this community. And uh, um, he's this sort of gentle, no-nonsense director, and he assigns Reuben a terrifying Pascalian task, to be alone in a room with his thoughts. I'm not making this up. This is literally the assignment to go sit alone in a room with his thoughts. This is what Joe says to him. You don't need to fix anything here. 
Nothing needs to be accomplished in this room. All I want you to do in this room is just sit. All I ask is that if and when you cannot just sit, you turn yourself to the pen and paper that I'm going to supply for you and I want you to write. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter how, no one's going to read it. Keep writing continuously without stopping until you feel you can sit again. Reuben looks for a loophole. Does it have to be writing? Can I draw? He's, no, 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 you have to write. And Joe says, in an act of solidarity, I'll be in my apartment, and you know what? I'm going to be writing too. Now, on the first day, Reuben steps into this room. He takes the donut that Joe leaves him, and he mashes it in a rage, angry and befuddled at the futility of this sight. What are we doing? What is this? This is stupid. And the only sound in this scene is the sound of silence, which is pierced by Reuben's angry screams and pounding fists and monologue just laughing maniacally at the silly futility of it all. At first, we are hearing what Reuben cannot. But then we're pitched back inside Reuben's head. The world is muffled. But it's pulsating. It's rumbling. The world isn't heard so much as it's felt. In short, percussion is how this world is experienced. Stillness is hard. This is going to take practice. But the beautiful sort of center arc of the film shows us that Reuben is beginning to belong. He's enfolded into the community. He's, he's finding himself in this new world. And there's this beautiful table scene that would remind, if you've seen Babette's Feast, it's so mindful of, of Babette's Feast, where you can see this boisterous laughter as the soundtrack of communion. And then we cut to Reuben, and he's back in his Pascalian cell again and leaves shimmer outside the window. Clouds roll and roil. And he sits quietly. But the next day, he sneaks back into this office to get in on the internet. And the old world wends its way back in and the lure of what was and what might have been and the lure of her who he left behind and his progress is undone. And so Reuben decides he's going to fix the problem. He desperately amasses what he needs for cochlear implants. And after the surgery, he shares the news with Joe who's in his room sitting, writing, trying to be still. I did the deed, he tells Joe. He signs to Joe actually. You can see that Joe is pained. He's even tempered, but he's saddened, and he replies, I wonder, all these mornings you've been sitting in my study, sitting, have you had any moments of stillness? Because you're right, Reuben. The world does keep moving, and it can be a damn cruel place. But for me, those moments of stillness, that place, that's the kingdom of God. And that place will never abandon me. With tears in his eyes, Joe tells Reuben that he won't be able to stay. As you know, he says, everyone here shares in the belief that being deaf is not a handicap. It's not something to fix. It's pretty important around here. All these kids, all of us, need to be reminded of it every day. And my house is a house built on that belief and built on trust. And when that trust is violated, things happen, and I can't have that. There are too many others to consider. So now Reuben has lost his hearing. And now in trying to recover it, he's actually lost the community that welcomed him. It's loss upon loss when there was a gift to be found in the stillness. And Re Reuben's losses keep accumulating. And at the end, the cochlear implants don't restore his hearing. They simply introduce a noise so unbearable that Reuben finally has to unplug them and is left with utter silence. In an unimaginable quiet, under dappled light through trees in the park, watching children laugh and play, Reuben just sits. He's found something. He's found stillness. 
What I can't properly recreate here in describing it is the way the medium of film performs this in a way that no argument or description ever could, in a way that Pascal's Ponce's never could. The film as art invites us to consider our, our comportment to the world. And in a sense, the movie itself is actually like Joe's assignment. This kind of movie is an invitation to us to sit quietly in a room and make ourselves available for experience, an experience we can't control, to make ourselves vulnerable to an encounter that might challenge and unsettle us. Listen, if, if you've only been primed to watch superhero movies with frenetic editing and flashing lights, watching Sound of Metal is going to feel like hard work you're going to feel the way Reuben did sitting in his room until you find a way to give the film a different kind of attention, until you give yourself over to the difficulty. Now, let me say one last thing in uh, um, closing. There is a certain bind that we should note here. A kind of spiritual catch-22, a circle. It's not a vicious circle, but it's a circle that we have to confront, which is this. Contemplation is a discipline. It's a habit of mind. And like any habit, wanting it is not enough to get it. It takes practice. And so while I'm encouraging us to see the practice of contempl in, uh, uh, see contemporary art as offering us practice in contemplation, we should also recognize that we won't necessarily find ourselves with the dispositions and habits of mind needed to dwell in front of an Agnes Martin painting. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't want people to go away from here and say, yeah, I want to be the person who stands in front of, and then I don't want you to feel bad when you go to the gallery and you're, you're, you're trying. You're trying. You're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. If you've never encountered something like an Agnes Martin canvas before, you can't simply walk up to it and start contemplating. There has to be an initiation into this way of being still. And so here's where the last piece of ancient wisdom is so relevant for us in the 21st century. It will seem strange, but we learn contemplation in community. Right? It's slightly paradoxical. We actually learn how to do the work of introspection and contemplation and diving into our own soul when we are part of a community that comes around us, alongside us, and apprentices us into that kind of attention. We, like Reuben, need Joes in our lives who prod and guide and help us. And so, too, with contemporary art, to overcome our initial alienation. We need communities to encourage and guide us, who apprentice us to the practice. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll just close with this. This is why I am sold out to image, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what we do at image. The, the vision uh, of, of image is primarily to build a community of people who are walking alongside one another to encourage us to be able to receive the gifts of contemporary art. Why? Because we believe those gifts are channels for spiritual encounter. And so the, 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 the whole wager, the whole uh, uh, um, vision is the sense that we do this together. We walk alongside one another. We build communities that are bent on teaching and giving one another the gift of learning how to attend to the world differently, attend to art differently, and hopefully train our own attention anew. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
All right, uh, Jamie, thank you so much for that talk. Thanks. I'll let you get situated. Another thank round you. of applause, please. I oh, appreciate stop. that. Uh, so my name is Guy Delcom. I'm married to the woman that you first met, um, Marissa, and uh, we come together. Art House has been my creative community for the better part of 10 years. I'm a writer, and I uh, feel safer saying this over the last several years, poet, write poetry exclusively uh, for the last five years, uh, which is great. So I love that you ended on uh, reinforcing the importance of community especially. Mm. One thing we've been exploring through the origin formation series over the last several years is how a person is in the world, like who they are, but maybe more importantly, how they are in the mm. world, right? As a believer, as a Christian, as an artist, as all of those things comprehensively, um, and bringing that into a place of community, um, calling people out of the creative isolation yes. um, that is necessary for good work, yes. um, but bringing it into a place where we learn Great. and we have a common voice. So Fantastic. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'm always in awe sometimes whenever I hear someone share from a long path behind them of their learning. Um, and maybe a good place for us to start is maybe dive into your personal story a little sure. bit. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm only doing this. Let me just pull the curtain back a little bit. I'm going to ask one question, and then we're going to open it up to you guys um, to ask questions. Don't know how that's going to go, but I'm giving you a little bit of a clue here. Get your question ready. Um, buying you some time. It's a little trick, right? Um, so <laughs> we're going to have a, one mic going around. Honestly, we could, uh, we could probably have three questions at the most. So if you're going to ask a question, I wouldn't sit on it. I would just raise your hand, stand up, or get Marissa to see you so she can put a microphone in your hand. Um, but the, uh, there's one, um, one article that I read very recently in the Christian Century, uh, which I found amazing, particularly when it was published um, and, you know, in the pandemic year. Um, yeah. And uh, you were unpacking um, a, a long thought, which I appreciated, a change, a shift, right? But in, in that, um, you shared a personal story, which I appreciated. And it was from early on, I think you were 18, 19 years yeah, old. Yeah. And uh, you described a scenario of uh, ministry. Yeah. And it was a dynamic duo, you and a friend. Yeah. Uh, buddy playing popular songs on a guitar. And uh, I, I can't remember the specificity of the mechanism you had. Yes. But it was essentially yes. to present a message that would convince people yes. um, of a truth. Yeah. Um, message of sin and salvation, the reality. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to ask, I'm going to read this question so I don't lose myself in the wordiness, but I wonder if you could share your thoughts um, that contrast this early experience using art almost as a utility yeah. to convince someone of a truth versus art and, and even beauty as a helpful guide to a connectivity in our own lives with our belief structure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. So yeah, the this, this story was just, um, I, I was... I became a Christian when I was 18 and was very, very ardent evangelist. And so we did what was called sketchboard evangelism. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard of this. And we would, uh, we would have this board up and it kind of looked a little bit like a sort of wheel of fortune thing where you were like, it's almost like you were going to turn the things, but what you did is you paint a few things and all of a sudden this message would come out and it would be like, you're going to hell. Or, I mean, no, it wasn't that, but it was like, it was very, very, uh, direct. But my buddy, uh, uh, who was older than me, what he would do is he would play Dylan. Wow. He would play um, John Le or, uh, Beatles songs. He would play, you know, kind of uh, 60s and 70s folk music. And it was basically we were tricking people. So we would we'd be playing these great songs just on the street to kind of get people's attention and gather a crowd. And they're like, oh, cool, it's going to be a concert. And then we're like, nope, we're going to give you the truth. And then we would do this message thing, and it would be like, this is, uh, um, and you're right. What, what was so sad about it, two things were sad about it. First of all, I wouldn't change any of this. This is all part of God's providential story of how he shaped me. But uh, um, uh, what was sad is, first of all, I only envisioned truth as a proposition, right? The only way I knew to think about truth was in this sort of narrow bandwidth of getting messages out to people's heads. And relatedly then, the music was really just a hook 
it was, as you say, it was instrumental. We were just using the music as a sort of like reeling people in to then engage their, their cerebrums uh, to really, because that's where we thought truth resided. And, and I would say uh, the, the long adventure of my career has been realizing what a terrible and unbiblical dichotomy that was. To imagine that beauty and truth would be opposed, right? Or that beauty doesn't matter and only truth is this message. I, I think you and I would agree that there is, there is a truth enacted in a poem that can never be translated into a message, right? This is, this is a, a form, a, sort of a principle of literary criticism from uh, um, Alan Tate and others in the 60s is what they talked about, the heresy of paraphrase. The heresy of paraphrase says, the meaning of a work of art is carried in the form of the work. Therefore, you can't just sort of say, and here's the nice little prose summary of what this poem or painting or film or novel means. Because its meaning is enacted in the very materiality of the form. So um, I think a big part of that journey was discovering the riches of the Christian tradition that was so much older than my sketchbook instruction, so to speak. Do you know what I mean? And realizing, oh, um, this is an ancient wisdom of Christian faith that these things are more integrated. Yeah. And um, I'm trained as a philosopher, but it, it was like a philosophy learning the limits of what we could grapple with logically and that in fact there are ways that God is going to encounter us more powerfully on these affective registers that the arts speak to, yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Did I? Is that? Am I? Am I in the ballpark of your question? Yes. That's great. You should follow up. Love that. Um, I uh, I love what you say about uh, particularly. I mean, using the creative discipline that I adhere myself to, poetry. Yeah. Uh, poetry can easily be um, a book and a few stanzas. Uh, if you will, of thought, right? Yes. Um, one word carrying several uh, paragraphs worth of um, thought, conviction, experience, history, and all. Uh, and I love the connection with, I mean, the simple thing of the discipline of being still to know that God is who God is, um, what Psalm, the psalmist tells us. And in a similar way, beauty and art brings us, as in, in a medium, brings us to that place. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's any particular point along your way where beauty, where those two values kind of balanced a bit to where mm. um, beauty began to rise, a particular book or a particular experience. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if I had a sort of come to beauty moment. Uh, <laughs> It's probably more, it's probably, uh, um, it's more of a pilgrimage than an altar call kind of situation, I would say. I, I, I would say that um, it probably was, I mean, I, I, I know some of the seminaries that some of you went to, so I know that you also have experienced this. And it is, um, when I was a young man, I used to pride myself on saying I didn't read fiction. Why would you read fiction? I'm interested in the truth. <laughs> Later, I, I'm just, don't tell anybody this. But I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a, like a, the narrowness of the mindset. And so I, I think it was probably, it, would, it would definitely would have been through fiction uh, that I was sort of welcomed back into this. But um, uh, interestingly, as an encouragement, I would say, it was also somehow as a family, we decided, there's probably a, cause effect chain here that needs to be thought through but somehow as a family when we had four little kids we decided that whatever city we were in we were always going to the art museum huh. it was just like a family commitment that we would go to the art museum and so then it's been interesting that in a way it has been a pilgrimage for us collectively to encounter and now our kids lead us in many ways because they did art history at college you know they're sort of it's it's really a, a special way i think to bond as a family unit yeah. that way yeah. yeah i love that okay i wonder uh 
Yeah, there we go. We have a hand up already. So Great. we have a question. Um, so we'll have one question, and then let's just see where we are after two more. And uh, maybe we can squeeze in a third, but let's commit to three. I, so first I have to say that phrase, come to beauty moment, is worth the price of admission. So thank you. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, but um, so the, the question I'm, I'm wondering has to do with corrupting contemplation and what you would think or, or what you might have observed about the ways we corrupt contemplation and how we might recognize that we're corrupting contemplation. And, and, and is, the, is the word, sorry, is the word corrupting? Corrupting, corrupting. Yeah, 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 yeah sorry, yeah, I should yeah. speak more yes. directly into the mic. Corrupting. Yeah. For example, maybe we see uh, sound in metal and we give ourselves to it, but not really. We're only making pursuit of contemplation cool replacement for distraction or a cool mm. replacement mm. for pursuit of affirmation. Mm. So mm. can, can yeah. you dive into that space? How do we yeah, do that's that? Interesting. How can we recognize right. it? It's a, it's a really interesting question. And in some ways, I'm, I'm just starting to sort of think through this. So my, my first thought is to say, yes, let's say there is the, the end of authentic contemplation to I want to say is always going to be a place of vulnerability that opens me up and it's opening up it's opening me up to myself to others and ultimately to God right it, it's like creating this crack in the buffer of myself so that I'm open so if the end of authentic contemplation is vulnerability and being opened up um, then maybe corrupted contemplation. I, I, part of me doesn't want to give that the name contemplation, but it would be, yes, you could have sort of a, a weird versions of self-absorption that, and the way you would know the difference is it just keeps coming back to like affirming or securing or guarding or protecting me rather than bringing me to this place of vulnerability and openness. Or, or, and maybe you could say, too, in that corrupted form, there's really also just not much that I'm risking. I think, I think in some ways the risk is built into authentic contemplation. That's a really interesting line of questioning, though. I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah, it's helpful to me to think about it. Uh, Marissa, microphone. You had one job, Marissa. <laughs> We have a few hands up here, too. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering about the, the connection that you would see between uh, art and beauty. Yeah, um, yes. It, I would love to talk about this. Go yeah. with it. What, what, what connection do you see if, if, if there is more of a separation in contemporary, if you would see it as more of a, a mimesis versus a catharsis uh, if, if in a, an absence of beauty? I don't know if those are categories you would use there. Yeah. If you know where. Um, so I'll, I'll just say this. I do think it's really, really important that we do not collapse the way we value art into saying it is synonymous with beauty. Now, I, I, and I'll also say, I do think that this is actually a particular ax that Protestant traditions should grind, um, which is to say, I think the arts, I mean, clearly, the arts traffic in beauty, but I would say the arts traffic in more broadly allusivity, following my teacher Calvin Searville, the arts traffic in a particular kind of kinesthetic affectivity and materiality that is so that the goal of the arts isn't always a presentation of beauty, though that is included, but rather the arts is about the staging of an encounter that is happening on a register that is sort of pre-cognitive or pre-intellectual, uh, if, if that makes sense. So that what a poem means and what a painting means is again always something that's working on a different, on the level of the imagination. So I, I wanna tie the arts inherently to imagination and allusivity and metaphoricity um, and beauty would be one of those things. The only reason I don't want to make art synonymous with beauty is because I think sometimes the most powerful things that art shows us is brokenness. 
Now, there is a way to thinking about that as you can do a certain kind of acrobatics to turn that into beauty too, but uh, um, I, I, I think it's not necessary. Uh, and um, to use theological phrasing, I think if art is only synonymous with beauty, you get a theology of glory. But if you think of the arts more broadly, it's more resonant with the theology of the cross. And I think lament fits in that stream better. Yeah. Good questions. Hi, I'm right there with you on all of this art and faith. Um, and I'm wondering, as someone who's in um, a academic and ministry field like yourself, and then also someone who's in serving in contemporary worship type of settings, how can I help? How, like, what would be your advice on helping those around me broaden our mindsets from the, like, use, like kind of the dichotomy between truth and and art, but also broadening the understanding of truth back towards not just treating art forms like music as vehicles of pop right, right. repetition and, and regurgitation. Right, yeah. right. Or instrumentalizing the arts for, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's a long, I bet this is exactly the kind of conversations you sometimes have at Art House Dallas. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, subscribe to Art House Dallas's newsletter. And um, uh, boy, it's, it's hard to know because I do think there's a certain, like, contextualism to what the particular challenges are in a community or tradition or congregation. Um, I mean, in some traditions, what I would do is I would actually kind of build back from communion. <laughs> do you know what I mean? In other words, I would build from the sacraments and to help people understand what's going on in the sacraments and to realize that that is an analog to precisely why we encounter God in the matter of the arts. But if you're not in a sacramental tradition, then that's not the greatest lever to pull to get people there. Um, um, I, think, I think part of it is giving people a taste of things that they haven't encountered before and not immediately asking them to evaluate it or understand it, but to just dwell with it for a while, to taste and see, and let the tasting and seeing endure and to realize that it might be doing more work than you're trying to convince them to put these things back together again. Just do it, show it, uh, um, invite them and uh, I, I think that can be powerful. That's a completely inadequate answer, but uh, a start. I think uh, we have a question, uh, maybe two more, depending upon this. But um, something you were saying just now has to do, like, brought me back to the uh, idea of mystery. Yes. And how art can invite us into a place that readies us for stillness. And I wonder if you'd talk just to maybe a little, maybe unpack that a little bit more. Um, on mystery, on, I don't know exactly how I'm trying to say it, but if I'm, you're nodding and I'm hoping yes. that we're connected. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, and this, is, so I have to tell you, this is, this is one of the, the pe so at, at Image we say that we are about art, faith, and mystery. And um, we would not be who we are without the three of those things held together. Yeah. Mystery here is not a puzzle to be solved. It is a depth in which one would swim. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I think the difference is, is you know, we all have kind of Angela Lansbury notions of mystery, which is, okay, right now we don't know who did it. And so what we need to do is just sort of get our, all of our inferences right, and then at the end, the mystery is solved, right? That's kind of a ne what I would call a negative conception of mystery. It's mystery where you just lack knowledge, some piece of the puzzle, you're going to put it together, and then you know. We're talking about mystery. I, I think St. Paul talks about mystery in this way, which is positive mystery, which is simply the depth and infinity and plenitude and profundity of something that we'll never grasp, yeah. Yeah. but you swim in it. 
and you explore and you encounter different facets of it. And I think art, it seems to me, is essentially predicated on something like that, right? Any good art. There's a lot of bad art in the world. One way to know a bad work of art is you encounter it once, you get it, and you never have to grapple with it again. Honestly, right? You say, oh, okay, I see what that's about. Whereas profound art, good art, is the poem you can read a hundred times. And there's still something that's giving itself. Or it becomes, it, it's like the way um, stained glass works, where at a different time of day, it is a different work of art. And depending on where I am, I'm encountering something else. I, I, think, I think that is the fuel of the arts. And in many ways, I think it is the distinct province of the arts because I think so many of the other facets of our culture squash mystery, yeah. right? They want everything straight up or superficial or easily digestible or whatever it might be. And, and it's why the arts, again, I think are, are like a way of practicing ourselves into being comfortable with not knowing. Don't freak out. It doesn't mean that you're not trusting. It just means you're not grasping. You're not comprehending. St. Augustine in a sermon says, he's trying to explain the Trinity, and he, he can tell all the congregation are confused. And he's like, oh, do you not understand this? It's God. You're not supposed to understand it. right? And I think that's, um, uh, American Christianity is not always very comfortable with that, though. We, we want our God figured out. Yep. And uh, I think the arts are a gift to the church, precisely to the extent that they disabuse us of that need for mastery, mm. in a way. I love that. Yep. Uh, we have a question right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so my question is, as an artist, um, how do you not become so consumed with yourself and your own imagination and like kind of idolize that and make it all about you and right. rather instead how do you incorporate God into the mix and make him first in your heart yeah you yeah know, and, and w without bec being becoming consumed with your own creativity you know right right that's a great question I mean in some ways uh, um you realize that as a creator, as a maker, as an artist who wants to give yourself away in that sense, you, you, it depends on you cultivating all kinds of other disciplines in your life that will not appear to be artistic, but in fact are shaping the kind of character that you have as an artist, right? And the relationship with God that you have as an artist. And so, you won't even see the kind of one-to-one -one A to B correlation between this spiritual discipline in your life and how it's actually shaping your sensibility as an artist. And yet it's going to be really, really relevant. It's one of the reasons why I think, um, so artists have not always had the most comfortable relationship with the Protestant evangelical church. Is that fair to say? And so one of, the, one of the temptations then is for the artist to then just kind of say, well, it's just going to be me and Jesus. And I understand, I understand the impulse if it's been a difficult thing to be part of the community. On the other hand, being immersed in the community is part of the fundamental disciplines you need to keep decentering yourself, right? And to encounter God in communion. So it, there, there's going to be a dance in that regard. I, I will say one other thing, which is um, on the other, uh, not, not on the other hand, I'll just say this. I don't think it is a sin for an artist to be ambitious. It is not a sin to be ambitious, right? Why? Because you should be pursuing excellence with the gifts that God has given you. You just shouldn't think that God's love depends on your accomplishment, right? So there's always a thing. I, I, I was reading the letters of Vincent van Gogh, and van Gogh, 
there's such a powerful spiritual thread in Van Gogh's letters. And it is, it's interesting to just watch him walk this line between a sense of awe before the mystery and also saying, I am painting the paintings that people will understand a hundred years from now. That's like, you go for it. That's like there's some, it is actually an incredible thing to have that sort of conviction and not be arrogant. And I'm saying you can have that kind of conviction and not be arrogant. You could say, how does Paul put it? Let, it, let um, you know, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Also, don't think more lowly of yourself than you ought. So there's a, there's a dance there. And that's also why other people are important. Yeah, Way more great. than you want to say. Um, I know we have several more questions. Um, so for the sake of time and to honor what we invited you into, we did tell you 8.30. I think the team said ish. I think we're in that ish space. Um, so the lawn is going to be open. Uh, I believe there's some beverages and refreshments. Uh, Megan is somewhere here. Um, she, if she's not here, she's outside uh, by the table where there's uh, resources and uh, from Image, from Art House, and then I believe Jamie's going to be around for a little bit. So please feel free to go back there and ask a few questions. They're not hanging out on the lawn all night, um, but if you feel so inclined, uh, feel free to ask them a little bit more. Before you leave, um, I'd love for you to share with everybody how they might learn more about Image um, and how um, if you as you've piqued their interest, how yeah. might they kind of jump into yeah. what you guys are doing? Yeah, um, uh, do go visit Megan at the table out there. You'll, you'll see the image is a journal. It's a beautiful artifact that's printed quarterly and you can subscribe. We have an email newsletter that you can sign up for right there too so you can get weekly updates. One of the things we do that is curate what things like what other people are doing like Art House uh, Dallas and so on and so forth. And um, you'll also learn about the sort of gatherings and activities that we are doing like you guys. Uh, community is so essential to this creative work. And so uh, lots of gateways to, to become part of it. That's great, that's great. Okay, so before you leave, um, my job is twofold and here's the second one. It's also kind of remind you about where we are in the, in the month. So um, all throughout North Texas, September is a month of generosity that's encouraging us to. This thing, North Texas Giving Day, that Marissa mentioned earlier, is a philanthropic machine for nonprofits here in North Dallas uh, or in North Texas. If you are not familiar with it, I'll give you an idea. Last year, North Texas Giving Day generated just above $50 million for about 3,000 nonprofits all across the North Texas area. I'm saying that because there are two local nonprofits here represented tonight. One is Art House Dallas, um, and we are a nonprofit, as is Central Commons, as is Image. North Texas Giving Day is local, um, so I would encourage you, there are three <laughs> nonprofits to be supportive of um, and allow your generosity, allow your pocketbook, if you will, to follow your interests in generosity as well, because there's good work that needs to bring um, artists into community, that needs to bring people into a deeper contemplation of who they are in relation to God and how they are in the world around them. Um, but, so there's, um, as it relates to North Texas Giving Day, please feel free, you can literally go to northtexasgivingday.org, right? Yes, org. Um, and then you can search, I just need some affirmation. And then you can search Art House Dallas or Central Commons. Um, you will read about the need that both organizations have um, and what you can partner with um, and how you can help us out, right? So an immediate response, if you feel so inclined, um, financial gift would be amazing, right? Um, I would also encourage you to poke around on the websites and figure out how you might involve yourself in the communities that are being represented. Image, Art House Dallas, and Central Commons. Um, learn more about all three organizations. With that, I believe we are done for the night. There are no other announcements. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy the company of one another. This is our first time doing this live for about a year and a half, so enjoy it while it's here. Have a drink, talk to Image and everybody else. Thank you so much.